So the Felzenolog DLC has been out for a little over a week, and in my totally timely fashion, as promised, it's time for me to review Fire Emblem Engage's newest DLC. And if you've seen any of my past reviews, you already know what to expect, but just in case you're new, in this video I'm going to go through the entire story of this DLC in as little detail as possible for the sake of brevity, and while doing so I will also be discussing my thoughts on the story, of course, as well as the characters, the battle and even a few theories that I have. And just in case you clicked on the video hoping for a spoiler free review, as always, I got you covered. So weirdly, there isn't an extra menu option to go into this DLC's story like with the Ash and Wolves DLC from Three Houses. Instead, for whatever reason, you have to go into the Somniel and interact with the well located in the top right hand corner of the map. And though it's never really explained why Alir has to dive into this well or how Alir Lear leaves the alternate universe they are thrown into, we do get a pretty concise storyline from Felzenolog that is pretty good. It has its ups and downs and is nowhere near my favorite Fire Emblem anything, if I'm going to be honest, because though I do think I like this DLC, it's definitely got its problems. Now, as far as the gameplay goes, all of the maps and the fights are honestly, I think, my favorite of the whole game, if I'm going to be honest. And the new units are absolutely great, aside from one. One of the new characters is absolutely infuriating at how much of a wet paper towel they are, and I'm not even joking, they are the sole reason it took me four days to finish a DLC with single digit chapters. It's absolutely ridiculous. And look, I know I'm not the best at tactical RPGs, but the fact that I played this on hard and every map took me probably twice as long to beat as the final boss of Engage's main story is a problem. My problem mainly, but outside of me wanting to pull my hair out at times, the maps were just perfectly made and the fights themselves were exactly as challenging as you would hope they'd be. As for the new characters though, they were also 10 out of 10. And I really do wish we got more new characters, but the developers definitely went for quality over quantity. Honestly, there isn't a single thing I dislike about any of the new characters aside from two major things which I can't really talk about in this spoiler free review, but just know it gets really weird and honestly just... <sighs> As for the stuff considering the characters we already know and love, I have mixed feelings but I can't really cover it here because, you know, spoilers. Now with the story, the first few chapters are great, but at some point it takes a very interesting shift that genuinely caught me off guard and I really enjoyed it, but the execution of everything after this shift was like the world's worst roller coaster. And even though I very much disliked the last two chapters story-wise, the fights of these two chapters are honestly my favorite fights of the entire game. And with the way the deal DLC ends, to put it simply, it's pretty sloppy. I don't think I've seen anyone say they like how the DLC ends, and that's me putting it lightly. But despite the ending, I think the DLC as a whole is pretty solid, and definitely worth playing for the fights and new characters alone. But with the spoiler free review out of the way, from here on out I'm of course going to be diving into full spoilers for the DLC. So if you're not looking to be spoiled before you leave, make sure to leave a like and subscribe, and hopefully I'll catch you in the next video. But with the shameless shilling out of the way, let's dive into the story just like Alir loves to dive into weird glowing wells. So after diving into said well, Alir interacts with an alternate version of themselves that takes the form of whatever avatar you don't choose. And once the brief conversation with that version of Alir concludes, our Alir wakes up in the Emblem Vault after being summoned by two fell dragon twins named Nell, who has the ability to attack foes in her fell dragon form, which is absolutely sick by the way, and Nil, the wet paper towel that I was talking about earlier. I'm not even joking, like I'm well aware that I'm not the best tactician since Robin in Awakening, but goddamn was the first battle and every battle afterwards so annoyingly difficult because of Nil and Nil alone. I genuinely don't understand why the devs thought that letting Nil get attacked a single time 
equals an instant game over was a good idea like at all it took me two and a half hours and roughly two resets to get through this battle without being hard locked into an instant death for my beloved paper towel and even with the yunaka Korin combo and just having him sit in the fog all day it was just so aggravating at how easy it was for enemies to kill him despite having the avoid boost anyways after defeating a hooded evil Fogato, who was in possession of the emblem bracelet that holds this reality's tiki, Alir attempted to summon it, but for some reason was unable to. Nell, on the other hand, was able to summon Tiki before also putting her to sleep. And notably, Tiki, despite being corrupted, was able to speak. After letting Tiki get some much needed rest, Nell then explains that she puts the emblems to sleep so they cannot be exploited for their power any further. And all the emblems had been asleep until very recently. Had been asleep until recently. Nell also explains that quite a few things are different in this reality. The first of which being that Queen Lumera had died in the battle a thousand years ago while sealing Sombron. And when Sombron was finally freed, this reality's elite died when they killed Sombron at the end of the war. And due to that, there are no more divine dragons in this world. So by process of elimination, the one who is waking up the emblems is probably another sibling of Nil and Nil. But more on that later. Just like in the main game, the first country that we visit is Firinae. And when Nel and Nil welcome Alir to the kingdom, they explain that this country's people are full of vengeance and quick to start a fight. Especially the members of the royal family. We also also learned during this conversation that Queen Ev was killed in the war, and King Alfred has refused to speak to the twins since the war has ended. And just as they finish telling Alir about the situation, Zephia makes an appearance. But in this reality, she's actually named Zelestia, and she has come to inform Nell and Nil that Princess Selene is attempting to convince King Alfred to invade Brodia. And while the group heads to the castle to try to stop this, we watch as Selene pretty much manipulates. Alfred into doing what she wants. And as Alfred finally approves for Selene to invade Brodia, Nell and Nil barge in to try A, to stop this, and B, ask Alfred and Selene for the bracelet, and after some back and forth between both parties, they agree to resort to violence. At least before Alir decides to try to de-escalate the situation, which fails due to Selene and Alfred convincing themselves that Alir was raised as a corrupted by the twins. Which, I can't say it is entirely out of the question given that all of the allies that we have access to in this DLC are supposedly corrupted. At least if the combat dialogues between Luis and Celine and Etier and Alfred are to be believed. Because both Luis and Etier play into their respective royals' beliefs that they are risen versions of themselves. This is also a reoccurring theme with a handful of other characters, so I'm not really sure sure if we just brought everyone along with us or if these are actually corrupted versions of these characters. If you have some clarification on that, let me know. I would really much appreciate that. Now, once Alir and Co. finish beating some sense into both Alfred and Selene, they agree to hand over the bracelet for Hector peacefully. And just like with Tiki, he can speak which, again, is very concerning. Also, I want to mention that I'm very confused and just straight up baffled about this resolution being so peaceful, because why are we just walking away, not concerned at all, about what both of them have said to Alir during the fight? Especially Selene, because she literally said that she has always wanted to try to kill Alir, but they were just saying those extremely violent and strange things because of stress? I'm sorry, but who talks about beheading someone and always wanting to kill someone because of stress? On to Brodia, I guess. After crossing the border and learning that this version of Brodia is not only renowned for their hatred of war, but they also have the tightest border security on Elios, and with that in mind, the group finds Gris, or Gregory, who is being pursued by some of said border guards. And after running away from a battle into a nearby cave, I'm assuming, Gregory then explains that on his recon mission, he has learned that not only is Brodius sending forces outside of the country, but it also seems like Diamant and Alcris want to hoard the power of the bracelets for themselves. And we learn that when the bracelets are awake, just like with the rings, the bracelets can give an individual godlike power. 
but unlike the rings, when the emblems are all asleep, having all seven bracelets in your possession renders you immune to harm. And with that new information, alternate universe Alchris makes a surprise appearance alongside his brother, and after threatening to kill us, per usual, we dive into another battle that makes me yet again want to tear my hair out. Not only because of Nil's absolutely useless existence, but also fighting Diamant with Veronica as his emblem felt like an impossible task. And after successfully defeating him on the second attempt, when Nell asked for the bracelet, Alchrist outright refused to back down until Diamant finally talked some sense into him. And with Veronica now asleep, we actually learn a bit about Celestia and Gregory's backstories, and even see that Nell feels guilty for the state of the world, since she didn't stop the four nations laying claim to their respective bracelets after Alir died. But with that sad moment aside, we get yet another look into Nell's past and see her getting teased by some of her siblings before she ends up blacking out and killing some of those said siblings. And after coming to, she is even told by Sombron himself that she would be a suitable heir, which is kind of worrying. But once we return from that blast to the past, my suspicions were proven right, well, Kind of. I suspected from the moment that we got the release date trailer and even heard Diamant dying at the end of said trailer, it was probably either Nell or Nil who did the killing as much as I hoped it wasn't, but I was unfortunately right. We watched Nell kill Diamant and Alchrist after asking why they would decide to attack Lethos's castle. And with that information, maybe she was doing it for a very misguided attempt at doing some good, but she then reveals that she had also killed Alfred and Celine. So... Moving on to Illusia. On top of meeting Madeline, and yes, her name is pronounced Madeline, not Madeline. In passing, we learn that the veil of this world is dead, which is pretty upsetting, but also confusing because now we lost our scapegoat of who could possibly be this mysterious enemy. And... Also, we learn that Ivy is trying to revive Sombron. Soon after this reveal, we then meet this world's Mavier, who is exactly the same as our Mavier, by the way, which is kind of hilarious. And he tells us that Tamara is actually invading Illusia. And honestly, this chapter's battle was pretty fun. I like that it was two sides fighting while we were also fighting both of those two sides. It was really cool, and it was a lot easier to protect Nil. I might I just want to throw that out there. Anyway, after defeating both of the queens, neither of them were willing to give up the bracelets that they held. So, Nell felt that there was no other choice than to kill the both of them in front of everyone. And once Nell retrieved the bracelets for Camilla and Soren from the corpses, Alir finally asks Nell just what the hell is going on and why she killed Ivy and Tamara, especially in front of them. And Nell reveals that actually Ivy and Tamara were never alive to begin with. And neither were any of the other rulers or their armies this entire time, which does explain why the weapons that work better against Corrupted worked very well against literally everyone that we fought, but she even explains that she didn't tell anyone because she knew that Alir would probably find out eventually, and she was genuinely attempting to spare Alir and their feelings about this entire situation, which is kind of sweet, and I'm glad that Nell wasn't killing non-Corrupted versions of them this entire time time because I really like Nell and honestly if she ended up being the villain of this DLC I'd be so annoyed. Moving on, I'm skipping past the sibling confessing her love to another sibling for obvious reasons. Just please stop doing this sweet home Alabama bullshit intelligence systems. Do better. Get some help. Anyways, outside of that very weird scene, I'm not gonna lie, I know I said I think it would be lame for Nell to be the villain, but it was purely just because it's the obvious choice, at least to me. Nil, on the other hand, was honestly just absolved of any accusations from the moment we got into the first battle and he dropped dead in the first combat cycle. And the fact that this has been an act the entire time is absolute insanity, especially considering that he actually was the one to kill this universe's Alir. What an insane plot twist. 
at least again to me also i'm pissed because it means that this entire time bro has been holding out on us and the amount of times i've had to use a time crystal because he would get one shotted actually makes me angry because the entire time this dude was just passing out and faking it but we were getting the game over anyways which is bullshit but my horrible tactics aside after nil leads nil and the four wins to a death trap we see that alir was knocked out cold and dragged to somewhere in Solm, where while nil is bickering with them nil manages to find where nil brought alir to because of their innate sibling connection or something and she comes to save the day at least not before having to barrel through a whole bunch of corrupted and corrupted hortensia and fogato on top of that honestly Honestly, I love this fight so much. Not only is it finally handicap free thanks to Nil no longer being part of the squad, everything about this map was just awesome. I love that Alir was held hostage and it was kind of a time crunch to save them. Just absolutely perfect design in my opinion. Anyways, once Alir is saved, they take the bracelet holding Krom and Robin and leave to go save the four winds while Nil pretends to be passed out. I also want to point out that Nell left Nil yet again with her dragonstone which I, I i don't she literally points out that she left her dragonstone with him on accident and probably should get it back from him but then just leaves it with him after i explain this please regardless while the four winds are trapped in a black ops zombies map with endlessly spawn and corrupted mavir proposes a plan that will stop the corrupted but also unfortunately kill them in the process and once they collapse the temple that they are trapped in nil catches up to nell and alir as they are headed to this temple and while nell has a lapse of judgment due to her having just lost her closest friends nil seizes this opportunity to kidnap her and run to the Somnio. And in another flashback that we are shown, Sombron reveals to us that Nil apparently isn't actually Nell's twin since her real twin died a very long time ago. Which I'm not quite sure why this matters at all. Besides another reason to want to save Nell, I guess? But I'm not quite sure if he is actually Nell's twin but just brainwashed like Vale is in the main story. Because before Alir arrives, we see that he is kind of having an episode and honestly not making any sense. But as soon as Alir arrives, we learn that Nil's whole purpose of going to the Somnio was that there was actually a ward placed on the Three Houses bracelet by this world's Alir and can only be removed by, well, Alir. And Alir, being the white knight that they are, ended up breaking this ward and handing over all of the bracelets to Nil, because why not? And after being given all seven of the bracelets, Nil uses the power to transform into a dragon. And before he can use this newly achieved form to carry out whatever his true purpose is, he does have some dragon killing of his own to do. And just when fell dragon Nil is about to kill Nil, he is stopped in his tracks by three of the four winds who tell us that Mavier teleported everyone but himself out of the temple with a warp staff that he just had in his back pocket. And with that, we finally dive into the final battle, which was very stressful. If it wasn't for me being given two rescue staves, I honestly wouldn't have been able to beat this battle on the first try. I honestly think that this was one of the best battles in the game as a whole, and I think it might actually be my favorite now that I'm talking about it. But either way, it easily is the best battle of the DLC. The dynamics on this map of Nil destroying sections of the map and having to kill all of the royals a second time was pretty great, actually. I just think the only missed opportunity was having literally everyone and I mean everyone plan fram the retainers everyone show up on the map and fight through all of them just to maximize how great this map is and also so we can see how different all of the characters are in this reality as a whole I personally am just really sad that we didn't get to learn anything about Alir's retainers Yunaka or any of the other characters that didn't get a mention in this DLC but that's just me Anywho, after defeating fake Nil, he reveals to us that the real Nil asked him to take his place when he died on a battlefield a thousand years ago. And that the fake Nil even did it willingly because he cared so deeply for the real Nil, and even grew to love Nil as his own sister over the years in a platonic sense. And as he prepares himself to die, Nil takes her own life, which I... I I'm honestly not even really sure how to feel about this. I mean, this entire situation is just 
so weird. And I'm not even really sure why Nil needed to not actually be Nil. But regardless, after Nil passes, the Dragonstone is destroyed. And it turns out that it was imbued in Sombron's magic that was making the fake Nil, or Rafal as we learn, act all evil. But... After this revelation, though he does not want to be forgiven for his actions, he decides that as punishment for himself, he will attempt to revive Nell as Lumera did for Alir. And after a thousand years have passed, he will then carry out his father's plans somewhat by joining Alir in our version of Elios. And after he initially declines Alir's invitation, he does end up saying that his answer may change once Nell is alive. And just before Alir somehow manages to find their way back to this alternate reality, the remaining four winds convince themselves to follow Alir back, since there's literally no one else alive aside from the three of them and Rafal. And once they make this decision, they pledge themselves to Alir going forward. And once we get through the undeniably cringy theme song in a end credits-esque sequence, we see Alir taking in the scenery of their Somniel, before Nell and Rafal make their presence known, and with the siblings reunited, that's it. The DLC is over. And I gotta say, I don't hate it, but I don't think I can say I love it either. I mean, honestly, the gameplay, as always in this game, is great, and of course, very different. I mean, it took me days to beat, and I was only playing on hard. I can't imagine how maddening is. I'd probably throw my Switch across the room. I love all of the characters, Nell and Celestia especially. Honestly, all of the four wins were great, and I don't care for the Madeline being in love with Mavier's subplot because it just feels really out of nowhere and forced. But that aside, they all were great. And of course, the incest on top of incest was just awful, but... Outside of that, they all were great. Nil is the only outlier, but honestly, I did kind of like him until the twist. So hopefully in any support conversations there may or may not be, I'll learn to like this Rafal guy. Hopefully. As for the Corrupted Royals, outside of Saline being an absolute psychopath and Tamara getting disrespected worse than Cyril in Three Hopes, I loved all of the changes for them. Alfred broke my heart every time he spoke because he was just so sad. Alchrist and Diamond's dynamic was very interesting. I really liked how much Alchrist hated Diamond instead of being envious of Diamond. And Ivy was just awful. I mean, seeing how she treated Hortensia just destroyed me. When I read not only Hortensia's dialogue when she battled her, but even when I had Hortensia and her retainers fight the corrupted Hortensia. It was just absolutely heart-wrenching what corrupted Ivy did to this child. Now, as with Tamara, I mean, this poor girl. She wasn't even on screen long enough for me to get what was different about her, which is kinda lame because I love her. As for her brother, Fogato. Now, with Celine, she was a scary unhinged. I honestly think they decided to make her a little too excessively psychotic because I'm not gonna lie, her dialogues in this DLC now have me looking at normal Celine sideways. And she's one of my favorite characters in this game. But with Fogato, he was like the perfect amount of unhinged, and that sounds so bad now that I'm saying that out loud. But Zeno Robinson's delivery of every line in this game is just perfect. Honestly, it doesn't even matter what version of Fogato we're talking about. And the corrupted Fogato's lines to our Fogato and even to Pandreo and Bune, they were all just so creepy. And at least with Pandreo's dialogue specifically, it made me kind of feel bad. The characters in this were fantastic. I do have to say though, the best thing about Nil being evil is definitely the dragon. I mean, that design is top tier. Both the great fell dragon form and the regular form when Rafal joins after the game. But for the story, I really enjoyed it up until the classic Fire Emblem dumpster fire button got pressed. And honestly, after that, it kind of just felt all over the place. I mean, personally, I would have enjoyed this a lot more if it was just another 
secret sibling who was the villain and not Nil. And though I did really like the twist, the reasonings and not committing to the bit was where it fell on its face for me. Not to mention the whole roundabout way of killing Mavier was just weird. Honestly, I feel like if they just had him die while doing recon in Psalm before Tamara invaded, the story wouldn't have suffered at all. And his death insertion just felt really weird. Is that just me? Also, why why do we have to have incest twice? Like, once is bad enough. Why did we make it tw Why did we- <sighs> I just- <sighs> I don't know how, but I- uh... Look, like, I can forgive it if the developers just forgot that Nell and Nil share the same father. Maybe, may look, maybe in this- in this universe, Alir is actually the biological child of Lumera. I'll forgive that. But still, why is why is Rafal in love with Nil? Why are we doing this? Who storyboarded this? Why, why did anyone approve this? What is happening? Stop! Just stop doing it! Just stop it! I thought we moved past the racism and the incest when we got engaged. Can we just move past it, intelligent systems? Please! I apologize. Anyways. Outside of my gripes, I'd give it- I'd give this DLC like a 7. I'm glad that we did get to keep the new units a la Ash and Wolves, and as I've said several times, I really like Nell, and honestly, all of the four wins are dope, and I can't wait to use them if we do get a second round of DLC, but if not, hopefully I'll be able to use them in the main story when I replay this game in like a year or two. But with that being said, let me know what you think. From the plot to the characters themselves, let me know what you enjoyed the most and the least about this DLC. If you enjoyed the video, make sure to leave a like and subscribe. All of the support is appreciated more than you could possibly understand. And hopefully, I'll catch you in the next video.